it's so important for us to really honour well as a family of churches. We need to do it better. And, um, and so we're going to have a time of just honouring Bill and Kathy. But I, I can't think of a better way to kick off our gathering of our family of churches than um, Pastor Bill sharing. So will you put your hands together and welcome Pastor Bill. Good afternoon. Now, did we welcome Pastor Ian Miller? So Ian, would you like to stand? You're a very special guest. Let's put our hands together and welcome Ian. Um, Ian is on our advisory council uh, as Christian Family Centre Churches, plus he's been 20 years here and uh, 17 years in Sydney, in Community Church Hornsby, part of our national executive team of the CRC, which we've just been meeting over the past three days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So we've finished lunchtime, had a short break, got my thoughts together for now to share with you. So, uh, so Ian, it's great to have you here. And uh, fantastic to, to see you all. And I know tonight we've got 300 people turning up. So get in there quick because the food will run out in about 10 minutes. No, Kathy's making sure there's enough food to, to feed an army. So, um, uh, yeah, no, it's a... So, Ryan, am I, can I go to this or not? It, you don't want me to use this. Okay, so I have to use this. Okay, look, um, I thought I had an hour to share. <laughs> I did too, that's right, yeah. No, we'll, we'll be right. Um, but uh, what I wanted to share with you was um, Jesus' heart for the Christian Family Centre and the whys behind our what's. It's easy to just be doing and uh, to be outworking our mission and our, our call without really thinking the reasons behind it. And the very first thing I just want to make this comment is about our call. Have I got the overhead? You got the... Oh, it's up there. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, our call. Um, and as Tim mentioned, this is now uh, my 41st year in leading the Christian Family Centre. And I just cannot believe it. Seriously, I cannot believe it's gone so quick. Danny, we're going old together. And uh, Dan joined the church in 19, 1986. Yeah, and uh, so a strange thing happened, and I shared this last Sunday. When I received the call to come, I'm 24 years of age, um, they tried to get me into the church the year earlier, um, and I basically said no. The church had started in 1976. I came in 1978, and I was like the guest speaker on Sunday nights once a month, and they were supporting me for the mission I was doing in reaching young people in the high schools. So I was a registered teacher and quit, quit a top job. Amazing. Ended up cleaning toilets for Jesus. Uh, and they were the filthiest, rottenest, smelliest toilets you could ever clean at a drive-in theatre. And you've got to believe what people get up to in drive-in theatres. Like, so 6 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock, I'm cleaning toilets, earning enough money to evangelise the schools. And, um, and so Christian Family Centre was supporting me. I remember they were giving me 50 bucks a month every time I'd go to, to, to minister. I think it was a little enticement to consider becoming the, the uh, lead pastor. Anyway, um, I accepted the invitation um, two years after it started and um, it was strange. As I accepted it, I had an invitation to go to a church in Victoria. Large church, full-time salary, buildings, you know, and the old pastor saying, I'll hand over to you within a couple of years and, and all that stuff. And um, very tempting. And yet there was no decision to be made. It was very, very clear that the Holy Spirit was saying, this group of teenagers, this group of young adults, and to confirm it, the great Barry Chant, who was our CRC state chairman, he says, don't even consider the other place. And they're, okay, yes, sir. That's what we did in those days. We just said, yep, just don't even consider it, Bill. Christian Famber Centre is your place. You need to grow with it. He goes, you need to grow with it. It's the right size. You're the right age. 
And, um, and so the assumption was this would be where I'd cut my teeth and learn a few things in, in perhaps four or five years and move on to somewhere else, you know, like try out and if they like me and if it works, I might stay a bit longer, otherwise go elsewhere because you've learned some things and don't make the same mistakes twice. Um, so, but when I arrived, as I'm praying to receive the call, I distinctly remember before the induction service, the feeling, I never tell people this, I felt it was a lifetime call. I felt the Holy Spirit saying, this is it. This is where you're going to spend the rest of your life. And I'm 24 years of age, just recently married. And uh, amazingly, I'm, I'm a Western suburbs boy. I've never shifted out of the Western suburbs for my 65 years. Um, so I felt, so in some respects, the call upon the church and its, its development is really tied up also with my own call. And sort of it's, it's like, uh, it's separate, but it's, it's, it's united. Um, and so, and I say that carefully because I know people like Philip and Janet and Steve and Marilyn who were foundation members here and then Ian and Lynn when they came in the late 70s. Look, it's a team effort. It's, it's, it, where there's a leader, there's got to be a team. If there's a one-man show, it's going to die. So I, I say this carefully, you know, that, that it takes a team and it's a body ministry. However, God does call people into leadership roles and, and, and that's why we take it really seriously when, in our appointment of new lead pastors as we have with Sam Barnes. Where are you, Sam? And uh, it took us six months to vet him. We vetted him, we got the cops under him, we, we checked out his past, we went through everything in his life. No, no, it was, it was a breeze really. Um, but we, we took it, you know, we really approached it most seriously and, and we do that because we want to see above anything else the call of God upon a person's life. That it's not just a job, it's not just, oh well this is, I'll do this for a short period of time and then I'll move on to something else. We, we endeavour to, to, to do that. Now in some situations people should be in, in a church for a shorter period of time. Pastor Alan Steele in... Um, um, and Derek Crozer in, in Alice Springs, that was not a lifetime call. It was, it was there for a season. And, uh, and then when we um, vetted uh, Ben and Reb, man, did we have to vet them really hard. Rebecca was easy. <laughs> no, but it was really obvious that um, the, the foundation of the vetting process was really, what is God saying? What is God doing? And when you hear the story... Like if you hear Rebecca and Ben's story, how God prophetically is speaking to them and they know nothing as they're driving up there for a holiday. It's like that. Okay, Lord, you're there before we were there. You were thinking, same as with Sam and, and, and Joe. When I read their story, thought about, that's an amazing story from little children, how God has been directing. And so the call of God is absolutely essential to understand what we do. It's got to be led by men and women who are called uh, by Jesus. And, and for me, it's been a lifetime call. And so people have been asking me, well, now that you're 65, just even the last couple of days, now that you're 65, like some of our guys on the exec, they're planning when they're going to quit at 65. And I'm thinking, quit? What do you mean quit? No, not quit. Change. Like, I'm going to hand the church over. Then. And I'm thinking, I don't understand that language. Um, I don't believe in retirement, I believe in refinement, uh, reappraising yourself, making changes, developments, but serving the Lord and his purposes. And for me, it's going to be in the Christian Family Centre. I can't see it not being elsewhere. Whether I continue in this leadership role, uh, that's, you know, as I get older, obviously that's going to have to be handed on. But I can't see myself ever not serving the Lord um, through the Christian Family Centre. I felt it was a lifetime call. And so... Um, I have felt, unless sickness stops me, and that can happen, you know, you just don't know. So I'm 65, I just turned 65, can you believe it? I just say, I don't look it. <laughs> I only look 55, right? Um, yeah. 
if my dad was here, he's saying, I've told you to dye your hair. My dad was 90, 99 when he went to be with the Lord and he used to dye his hair, his eyebrows, he looked like he was 70. He used to get on to me, dye your hair, son. I said, no. Um, so unless sickness, obviously, that, that's a factor. You have to, if you can't, if you're not well, you can't lead. And so that's a factor as you get older. And, and obviously the other factor is if, if the eldership board of the church gets sick of me, that's it, I'm going for a walk, you know, like. Um, so you can't lead unless, unless the team have confidence in you and, uh, and you're, you know, uh, you, you've got to lead through the team and you've got to lead with, with, their, with their full and uh, undivided confidence. Otherwise, that, that's crazy. For some of you who haven't read my three books, and I know that's half of you, I've checked, You've bought them, but they're sitting on your shelf. Um, one of the things I've, that's, I think, a good thing that's come out in it, in the, even though I was kind of pressed into writing them by Cass and others, I've tried to put down my story and the calling and the lessons and, and the journey. It's not an official history of the Christian Family Centre, but for you to understand um, the church, the whys behind the what's, You'd need to kind of read that and, and, and think, okay, that's why. That's why he does that. That's why he believes that. That's why we do this. I can't separate my own call into ministry from its, its outworking on a practical level in the life of the Christian family. And it's not to say that we are the best and how we do things is, is, is the perfect way. It's not. It's the imperfect way. But it is the way. There is... And, and I can't separate that. So our calling is so important. Um, so if you read those three books, it exposes and explains um, what's within my own heart and, and journey. I think, secondly, our purpose. I have, to me, you can just keep doing things without thinking why you do it. And... Um, and I write a whole chapter on this in, in the book on, on uh, the leader I can be, that I see it so often. People going through the motions. So, you know, I, I, I go to a lot of services. I see a lot of worship service, a lot of preaching, teaching. And sometimes I think, what, why is he doing? Or why is she doing what he's doing? It just seems like it's just words. Or it's just, um, there's not a reflective process. You can, I can tell, I mean intuitively, I can tell if a preacher hasn't been praying before he preaches. I can tell. I can tell if, if, if he's a professional speaker and he's come up with a nice message and if it, if it lacks the spiritual authority and that flows because they've actually been doing an awful lot of praying about the message and praying for the people, praying to God about the people rather than, than before they, you know, preach to people, talk to people about God. And, um, and so you can see, same with the song leaders. Are they going through the motions or is it birthed in prayer? Are they dependent on Jesus? Are they thinking through what they're going to say, how they're going to say it, to ensure that they're actually leading and taking them on a journey? And so I think in, in public leadership, in any kind of leadership role, there has to be the thinking process of, of why we do what we do. And for those that have been my personal PAs over the years, uh, they know how often I might labour over a letter for two weeks. And I'll go over it. Nah, and, I'll get, and I'll get it vetted. And uh, by them, and it might be some of the pastors, or then, then if they don't do a good enough job, my wife, she just gets the penny out and goes, Tch, attitude, Tch, attitude. You're venting here, like, because I'm saying, sweetheart, I want to be able to give direction without sharing my feeling of, of I don't want to hurt the person by making an emotional response. And so, oh, my glasses here. So, the, we've got to be thinking through very carefully um, why we do what we do. Uh, and I say that to all of our lead pastors who are preachers, song leaders, if you're running committees, team meetings, to be thoroughly prepared in your heart before you actually outwork it. And it just should be as natural as breathing. It's not a matter of spending hours and hours in prayer. It's that dependency on God that you are 
being led by him. You're listening to him and the voice, the voice of the Spirit um, continuously. So regarding our purpose, um, I produced this booklet, Moving Forward. And uh, again, it's for every lead pastor, every leadership team and spreading it far and wide because it actually outlines not just how we're structured, but the purpose of why we do what we do. And, and I think unless that's explained, people can get trapped into the processes of what happens and, and not look at why we do that. What's our history? Why did we come to this point of coming up with a governance structure the way it is as it evolved in the early 2000s? There's reasons for that. And it's a long history, uh, both within our... Um, Christian families and, and also learning from within our CRC movement which I'm privileged to lead and, and also just observing other, other movements. So I think um, in it I've just included things like the dream, who we are, our core values, our beliefs, our vision, mission and ministry strategy. That's all in here in the first half and you'll notice all that's in the beginning, the second half is the process of what we do and how we do it. So, the, the, the understand, and I think for our churches and our leadership teams, people coming into our churches need to know that. They need to know we're actually part of, there's history here, there's a heritage here, there's a learning that's taken place here, there's a connectivity, there's relationships, and there's reasons why we do what we do. Now, if you don't know who you are, and what you believe, and why you exist, and where you're heading, and how you're going to get there, you can't lead. You really can't. You, you think about it. You've got to know who you are, your identity, your, your, your connection with, with being a Christian. Uh, my service and uh, uh, my leadership roles have nothing to do with my identity as a Christian. Um, so if that fell over tomorrow, if I got sick and couldn't continue, I think I'm still going to be a really happy man. Really happy. And if they let me stay in the church here, I'd be even happier. Because my identity ties, ties in with who I am in Christ. And that first book, The Me I Can Be, outlines that, the gospel, the new creation, who we are. So many problems that I see have to do with all of our complexes, our family of origin issues and, and, and um, you know, what people think of us, what we think of ourselves, the baggage we carry. And man, we all need a divine overhaul to, to be restructured on the inside, to have a new perspective of who I am as a son of God, loved by the Father. And um, so you've got to know, and, and a church has to know, a movement has to know, the, the family centre, the CRC, who we are, and then what we believe. And so in here we've stated our basic doctrines, and they're the CRC doctrines, no, no difference. So if you look at the CRC charter, the, the, the abbreviated declaration of faith, it's in this little booklet. The detailed one, the Christian Family Centre detailed declaration of faith is in our constitution and it's also basically the one that we use for the CRC and people say oh well that's not that really important actually it is really important when you face a crisis and to know what you believe the, the whole issue within the uniting church regarding their understanding of sexuality and uh, you know is heterosexuality the only way is homosexuality a legitimate expression um, without being hateful and nasty towards people we don't we love all people whether they're heterosexual homosexual no matter what problems there's salvation and redemption for all but if you have a faulty view of the scriptures if deep down you don't believe that Genesis and Matthew are connected that Jesus referred to Adam and Eve as real people I mean, he, you know, so I believe in Jesus. He believed in them in real people. He doesn't say when it happened, you know, 4004 BC. We don't know when. He actually believed that they existed as people. When he talked about in Matthew 19 and he validated heterosexual union for life between one man and one woman, 
And then he added a special injunction. And what, you know, God has joined it, no man divide. We believe that at a profound level. And it's without being hateful towards people who don't believe that or, or, or disrespectful for people who choose to live other lifestyles. And so there must not be any hatred or homophobia or, or attitude towards lost people. They need Jesus. But if we don't know what we believe, just in that area, the church is being torn apart. And it's being torn apart because fundamentally the very first thing in our declaration of faith is the Scriptures. And if you don't have that correct, your Christology is going to go wacky do. Your view of Jesus. Then your pneumatology about the Spirit, that's going to go even further wacky. And salvation and holiness through Christ is going to be, end up preaching a social gospel of good works. And so... Knowing what we believe is really important. And, and so, of who we are, we're evangelical, Bible-believing, evangelical, Pentecostal. And, and so, who we are, what we believe is really important to understand your purpose and, and why we exist. What's our, what's, why do we exist? And, and we've enunciated this in, in the dream that we put together. And, and Cass and Tim and others helped me put this together, the dream statement that we released in 2005. And in it, it actually just outlines what we're on about. We're on about preaching Jesus to lost people, people to get saved, that God loves people, and that we must never stop proclaiming who Jesus is and what he wants to do and how he can save anybody. And so we, we are not just biblically grounded, but we are Christ-centered, cross-focused, Christ-centered, because we believe that without faith in Jesus, you cannot get to heaven. You, you are lost forever. And that's really unpopular today. But we, that's what we actually believe. And we're not going to shift from that as the Christian Family Center or uh, as, a, as a CRC movement. So who you are, what you believe, why you exist, where you are heading. Um, if we don't know where we're going, we're going to go all over the place. So, so we know where we're heading. And, and then also um, how we're going to get there. So in it, you'll see a strategic direction. You see the mission and vision of the church, a vision statement, a mission statement, a ministry strategy. And it's built around three scriptures. Acts 2, 37 to 47, the best description of what a New Testament church looks like, and the Great Commandment in Matthew 22, and the Great Commission in Matthew 28. So we've built our vision, mission, and ministry strategy around three, uh, probably the most important scriptures, I would say, in the whole New Testament. I'll say that carefully. When it comes to knowing what the purpose of a church should be, what better, to, what better statement than what a, new te- what a church should look like than Acts 2? What greater statement is there than the great commandment where Jesus closes the Old Testament and says, the whole Old Testament is built around this, worship God, minister to people. And then he launches the New, the new Testament with the Great Commission, which is repeated five times as evangelism, win the lost, church planting, world missions, discipleship, connecting people into fellowship. So we... That's, that's our dream, and we've, we've, we've placed it in here, and, I, and I've got a copy for you all to actually have a look at it, because it gives the whys behind the what's. Are you still with me? Our direction. The second half of this, it, it gives us, it shares about our rich history. And, and the many learnings that we've gained, we've tried to summarise it and why we've come up with the multi-site model uh, for the church. Um, and thankfully, we're seeing that happening more within our denominational family. So we have another multi-site, usually large churches. Uh, Joe Habermill, who was our youth leader here, he's developed a multi-site model. They now have three campuses. Theirs is a lot tighter than ours. Ours has a lot more autonomy and flexibility. Theirs is a lot more centrally governed and controlled. Doesn't mean it's, it's worse. In fact, in some things, they'll do things more efficiently and better than us. So Joe is the preacher. No one else preaches. He does all three. 
he's actually going to develop and the, the guys that he has are doing once a month. Ours is a bit different. We say we want our lead pastors to be preachers and leaders. So the multi-site model has varying expressions. Uh, Dan Parker, who's on our national exec, um, he's amazing what he's doing. So his idea is he's going to plant schools and churches at the same time. So they're doing it at Wyndham Vale. They're going to do it. They're, they're, they're making plans. The next 10 years, Dan's got these plans. And it's a multi-site situation. So a large church, that's about five or 600 people, has got the resources to be able to do that and to do it quickly. And Phil Kaiser is doing the same with, with uh, Cranburn. And uh, he's also on our national exec. So that's happening within our CRC movement. So what we have pioneered is now being embraced by our larger churches within the movement. And it's, it's a most legitimate model, but they express themselves differently. And so we need to, to understand this. You know, for example, in our appointment of, of Sam, it was just an interesting journey. So Davy Bland steps down as leader, and it was right for David to do it, three years, and he kind of helped prepare the way for Sam. But it was interesting, some people in the church said, well, why should Bill Vasilakis be involved? Why should the Board of Elders? Who are these people? And uh, so I had to reintroduce myself. And, and, inter- re- and, and to say, hey, so somehow in a crisis, oh, yeah, yeah, we know that, yeah, yeah, the Christian family, they didn't really understand it. So we have said, said one of Sam's chief tasks is anyone that's new, you've got to acculturate them to our governance practices. But not just say, this is the law, the why behind the what, because that's what actually convinces people. And it's not that our governance system is the best. I mean, uh, it, it's, it just is what is. And so Pastor Alan Kleanthos, where are you, Al? My beautiful Greek mate. He has is, he is said, Bill, in the next 10 years, can you find a new lead pastor before I turn 80? We've had this conversation for a couple of years, but Alan F is saying, you know what, 70, I'm, I'm heading, you know, like, so we've started the process. But Alan immediately connects, I share with the board, and there's, no, there's not going to be any issue with what we found at the hills. It's different. It's not saying that, I'm not blaming the, the people, it's saying it's, it's a leadership thing that has to be clearly explained. So the decision again will be, the leadership team and the board of elders working together to make it happen. So for Sam's appointment, our board, the leadership team and five women that we decided to hook, hook into it, didn't we? Four. No, our wives. So we had 16 people making the decision unanimously for Sam. So, so though there's governance and leadership, it's not a dictatorship. It's not a we're trying to find the will of God and, and, and to be led of the Spirit in it. And the same thing's going to happen at Lefebvre, and it's going to be good. But I'm just saying how different it is. And so we pray for Sam because he's, he's, we're realigning the church to understand this. And, and so that's why in producing this, it just remains black and white. But if you don't share it as people are coming in, it'll come back to hit you right between the eyes. People have to know why. I would not join a church unless I knew what it believed, how it's governed, and and the the systems that we've built in. So in our directions, the the why of why we do it. Can I also say, I am a, a strong denominational man. I love denominations. And this is like, oh, don't say that, you know, like... There's evidence now saying independent churches and groups of independent churches make minimal impact upon a society compared to long-standing denominations. And all this thing of, oh, we just want to be free, we don't want to belong. Minimal impact regarding social change. The tighter a denomination, the longer it will be, the more purposeful if it stays true to influence a society. The trend in America, sociologists are really saying, we don't know... In a hundred years' time, the church is influenced. Make go. Why? Because people are fleeing denominations. Denominations are dirty words, and they're saying bad move, deception of the devil. We need strong denominations with strong accountability, 
clear purpose, grounded, if we're going to make long-term social change. They can measure the influence of the Catholic Church, the Uniting Church, the Methodist Church, the Salvation Army, strong on Australian culture. If they're all separate and independent, the country's going to get poor in social services and in, in spiritual ministry. It's interesting, interesting phenomenon, what they're, what they're finding now. Some of the latest research that I've just, just checked out just the other day, I came across, I thought, that's amazing. I'm a denominational man, and my leadership within the Christian Family Centre has worked hand-in-hand hand with leadership within the CRC. Why, I don't fully know. I'm only a young kid, and they put me on the state executive when I'm in my 20s. I'm the state leader when I'm in my 30s, and... And, and, and so I just accepted my lot that whatever success and fruitfulness occurred in the Christian family, my leadership role here, that the movement said, Bill, we want you connected. So I love the, the CRC. I'm a total denominational man without being sectarian in any way. I hate sectarianism. We said, oh, we're better than others. No, we're not. We are what we are. We're not better than the Baptists and the Salvos and the Anglicans. We just are who we are. And with humility and faith, we say, God, but why denominations? Denominations are absolutely crucial for responsible and accountable ministry and governance. I would not belong to a church or a movement where the leader couldn't be sacked. I just wouldn't do it. I'm amazed people join the church because they like our preaching and lots of love and they don't know what they're getting themselves into. So we tell them, so this is how we govern and operate. So people are sheep. People are sheep. They don't ask the questions. And that's why there's so many sheep get ripped off and get fleeced and, and that. So denominations are good because they keep ministers accountable. They keep churches accountable. So, for example, our governance structure, and I'm hoping the CRC will embrace this more and more, our board of elders... Okay, so my role as senior minister, chairman of the board. C can somebody get rid of me? Yes, they can, the board of elders. My role as national chairman of the CRC. Can they get rid of me? Yes, they can, the national executive. Doesn't even have to go to a vote of the pastors. They elect me every four years. The national executive can toss me out if I'm an immoral or unethical or, you know, rob the bank or, or whatever. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I think it's fantastic. If you're going to exercise responsibility, you've got to be accountable. Problem in our CRC movement, and I had it and I love it, is some churches view themselves as being independent. So the eldership board is like the ultimate authority. Some senior ministers think they're their little pope. They can do what they want. You can be cardinal next week and you can be archbishop the next week and they're like, they think they're... No, that's wrong. And some eldership boards think they're a college of cardinals. They're, they're not accountable. So we have, we've had difficulties over the years where churches, a long-standing church, one in Victoria, 50, you know, like our second oldest church, a whole pile of pastors. A young pastor comes in. He's from the ex-Baptist. He develops an attitude. He's even sitting on the state executive of our, in Victoria, develops an attitude, changes their constitution... He's sitting on the exec, doesn't even let them know, then gradually makes a decision with his eldership board and the membership, and we get informed, they pulled the, the property, the church, right out of the CRC. I tried to intervene as national chairman, so did Bruce Sharman as our state chairman, and we just got, just, God's called us. And yet now he's resigned from being the senior minister. And some other young guys, and I think, what about the people who started the church in the 40s and the people who gave millions of dollars in the 50s and 60s. So, to me, if our board of elders, question, if our board of elders, say Norm's on the board and uh, Milan and Tim, myself, Cass, um, what if we went off with the fairies? What if there was division and there was potential blood on the floor? Who are we accountable to? We have built this advisory council. Ian Miller, Rob Gallagher, Barry Chant, and uh, Wal Beatty, Alf Shahadi, Ray Betcher. There will be some changes that will take place because some of these guys are in their 70s and they want to come off. 
and I'm not letting them come off, but they want to come off. So, the, But the, the thing is, they have authority to take over the lock, stock and barrel, but they have to work with our national executive. And we're writing our new constitution saying even changing that constitution, the advisory council have to endorse it beforehand. So, so a board can't sneakily say, oh, we're going to leave and we no longer believe the Bible to be God's word or we're going to leave and join the Baptists like Steve did. <laughs> Sectarianism. No, Steve's doing the right thing. In, he's on loan to the Baptists. Been on loan. Seriously, is I wouldn't belong to a church or a movement that wasn't accountable that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And to me, where people are given responsibility, there must be accountability. And it's not just I'm preaching it to our lead pastors. I am a lead pastor, as well as on the board. We, ha we have to practice it. So, so this is why um, we've produced this. And, and I trust that you can understand the reasons why. I mean, we had... You take property. We had an a outreach church that came up with an idea of purchasing something and, and they, it wasn't an established CFC church, but when the board looked at it, or Milan looked at it first of all, said, what? Crazy notion. It's a crazy notion. They would, they would have gone bankrupt. And so if we here at Seton come up with a significant building plan we've got to submit it to the board um, right now Alice Springs we're not quite there we want to sign there's a property that's come up we've been praying and believing for a couple of years and the property's come up we haven't quite signed keep it to you so we we'll pray with it next session but again On the, so on that one, the board have been involved in the whole process. Secondly, they can't afford it on their own. This is where the network of churches together to be able to accomplish something. So lead pastors of other CFC churches, get ready for a conversation with me if this comes through. You don't know what I'm going to ask you, do you? You don't know. Money support because the opportunity to double triple the church and reach into that area is fantastic so, so, so we just so again it's not just Ben and Reb and their leadership team it's the collective that's involved so we can do stuff like that so guys I've just shared a little bit with you um, to make you think and reflect on the whys of of the what's and um and encourage you to be thinking through and certainly please get hold of this I've got copies there and uh, and and think reflect talk if you have questions and you know, well, how does this work talk and let's reflect and make sure it happens so that we work in love and unity to see the the purposes of God at work we could not have established CFC South 35 people from here kids and adults about 130 now if everyone turns up Tim, we've kept Tim, the salary for Tim has been maintained by the, the Seton Church, not by the CFC Collective. But the CFC Collective, we put 7% of our income into a fund. Even though we support Ben out of that fund for two days a week, they're still putting 7% of their income to help plant that church. So you guys are planting that church. All of us are planting that church. The costs of actually setting that up have been a collective thing. And we're going to do it again and again and again. So that's why... It's important to let the church know. That's why at the hills I kept on saying, guys, you're planting this church. Here we are. Yes, yeah, 7% of your income is... It is 7% of our income. Didn't know that. Well, now you know. So pray and believe. And so, so this is where we're working together, not just in reactive ways regarding governance and decision-making, but in proactive ways to see the kingdom expand. So we would love to see this repeated north, east, further south and beyond. God bless you. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Thank you, Bill.